welcome to the Alliance for Democracies, the Populist Dialogues. I'm your host, David Delk. Today, our guest is Paige Shell Sperling. Uh, uh, Paige is a labor rights activist here in Portland who I first met at a meeting of the Oregon Fair Trade Campaign, which focuses on creating national and um, world, condition, world conditions favoring fair trade instead of free trade like the NAFTA and the CAFTA agreement. So, uh, in addition to doing work on labor rights, she's also involved with the Portland Central America Solidarity Solidarity Committee and also the Oregon New Sanctuary Movement. So welcome to the show. Thank you very much. Good, good. So before we get into the topic, and of course what we want to talk about is the situation which is going on in Columbia with uh, GM workers, but just, just for a moment, talk to us about the Portland Central America Solidarity Committee, what that is, and wh whatever information you can share with us about that. Great. Well, the Portland Central America Solidarity Committee is made up of community members, um, students, workers, anybody that's interested in solidarity with Latin America. So it's just a, a great group of people, and they work on all sorts of different campaigns. Okay, good. And, and the New Sanctuary Movement, what is that? That's an interfaith coalition of people that are working for immigrant justice. Immigrant justice. Can you, can you tell us just a little bit more about what immigrant justice means? Yeah, that means that um, they're looking for um, a just way for immigrants to be recognized as part of our community and to look at the issues that are, that are causing the need to migrate. Mm -hmm. Okay, yeah, so, so talking about the need to migrate, part of that, of course, goes back to the NAFTA agreement, which you know, was supposed to benefit the United States, Canada, and Mexico which seems to have hit uh, actually all three nations, the workers of those three nations, hard. Uh, and that's certainly the case in Mexico. Uh, and for at least some of us, including myself, and I suspect you, we would say that NAFTA is a major reason for having uh, increased the immigration, illegal immigration, into our country. Yeah, we saw after NAFTA was passed, immigration um, increased by about 300%. So basically, these are free trade policies that are making it so that the businesses can cross the borders freely, but the workers cannot. Mm -hmm. So the businesses, they, the corporations can go in search of you know, cheaper labor and um, lower environmental standards, lower worker rights standards and, and labor standards. Um, but the workers, you know, they're not able to pursue better conditions in other countries. Mm -hmm. Okay, right. And, and I know that some people have uh, suggested that borders should essentially disappear in terms of how workers can cross them. And uh, we won't go, that's, that's a topic for another program, but we won't go, but that, that's just an interesting, interesting idea. Um, when I first met you was at the Oregon Ferry Trade Campaign meeting, and we were talking about the Trans-Pacific Partnership. Can you just tell us just a little bit about, about that? Yeah, the Trans-Pacific Partnership is um, it's a big free trade agreement. It's similar to NAFTA, but it would actually be with a whole bunch of countries along the Pacific Rim. So it's kind of a docking, they call it a docking station agreement because other countries could join at other points in time. It's being negotiated in secret. We don't know what the text of that free trade agreement is. It's, um, it's being negotiated by corporate lobbyists and, and people that stand to benefit really at the harm of our communities and, and workers and the environment and everybody. Mm -hmm. right, yeah. yeah, and so one of the things I've heard about that is that even our congressional um, representatives and our senators are not privy to the, the negotiating documents. And so while the corporate sector gets to have their feedback, our representatives, the people that are supposed to speak for us, um, are still being kept in the dark. Yeah, that's right. Right, right. Outrageous. Right. Yeah. So let's let's talk about what's happening in Columbia. Um, General Motor workers at the factory there are on strike. So I'll just leave it at that. Go Excellent. ahead and fill in some details. Excellent. Well, what's been happening at the General Motors plant in Bogota, Colombia, is that workers have been leaving for years with injuries. And these are injuries that are caused by repetitive movements, by lifting things that, that weigh a lot more than what they should be lifting, and by having an accelerated work pace that leads to workplace accidents. So you can see most of the injuries, have, they're oste osteoskeletal, so they have to do with the upper limbs and with the spinal columns. Um, they include things like carpal tunnel, tendonitis of the elbow, 
um, rotator cuff syndrome, and then bulging discs, uh, herniated discs, all sorts of lumbar problems of the lower back that, that lead to pain going down the back of the leg. Okay, so there's a pattern of these kinds of, of occupational illnesses uh, resulting from working at the plant. Now, when I was there in November and I met these workers for the first time, they told us about some of their jobs. They were doing things like they were lifting up the car by the door, lifting up the car by the door, 142 times a day. Wow. So you can imagine that that is something that's just destructive of their bodies. Now, you couple that with the policy of the General Motors plant, which was to hire these guys for one-year contracts. So after a year, it's pretty easy to just not renew the contract. Now, couple that with the company having medical facilities inside of the plant. Okay, so these workers are going to the company medical facilities where their, their injuries are being detected. After their injuries are detected, they're, um, they're being fired for other sorts of pretexts, right? So they, all of these workers are contending that, that they were fired for their workplace injuries, but they were given a different reason. Okay, and, and uh, how long has this strike itself been going on? Well, most of the workers that are involved in Asotricol, which is the association of uh, injured workers and ex-workers of the General Motors plant, Comotores, the subsidiary in Bogota, Colombia, the members of this group, they, most of them were fired between three or four years ago, some of them more recently. Um, but they've basically, after they were fired, they were just left on the street without anything. So they've, you know, they've got these these illnesses that have made 30-year-old men walk with canes, right? Mm. They're serious injuries that require back surgeries. Um, some, they need some pretty serious help, help with their health issues. Um, and they haven't been able to find employment. So they've been you know, out on the street without a job, without a way to take care of their, their physical health, and without a way to take care of their families. So they haven't had food in their houses. Their families have been going hungry. They've been losing their houses to foreclosures. Um, They've had critical services like water and gas turned off. Um, so it's just been a very critical situation yeah. for them. Okay, yeah. And, and the, the uh, GM, did GM provide health care, you know, as we know it here in the United States? Well, hopefully better than what we know here. <laughs> <laughs> they had health care up until the point that they were laid off. Okay, all right. So, so, so the pattern is you, you, you're a new worker, you get a one-year contract, and during that contract period, you get, you get health care at the company health clinic. Mm -hmm. uh, and then, particularly if, you, uh, if they find that you have some kind of injury, then they uh, just don't renew your contract. They don't renew your contract or they fire you for a different reason. Some of these guys have had stories made up about them that they've uh, threatened other workers. Um, you know, and I know these guys, I met them personally, and it just doesn't match up with their personalities or, or the evidence, they've got a lot of evidence that show that it's the workplace injuries that are, that are causing the firings. Okay, and, and how did you happen to be down there? Uh, I went with a Witness for Peace delegation back in November. That's when I met them. And then um, I actually attended the Labor Notes Conference in April with the president of the association. He was able to come up and speak about what's going on down there as an international guest. Um, and then I went back down in June for a week, and I spent a week with these workers oh. and their families. Okay, great, good. Uh, I know you have some YouTube videos which are available online, so why don't we cut to one of those right now and just watch that, and then we'll be back to you in just a minute. Excellent. Okay, great. Realmente la situación después de que nos despidieron, que me despidieron a mí de la empresa ha sido muy dura para mi familia y para mí. Nos han cortado el agua, el gas. Eh, pues nos han cortado la luz. Que la niña menor de nosotros se nos quemó. Se quemó la mano con una vela. Con una vela. Se quemó con una vela porque ya llevamos seis meses sin luz. Y ella es una hermana que, que no está en este momento, pero que ya desde donde está nos está apoyando. Entonces ella nos, nos regaló la luz por medio de un cable. Yo estoy acá de lunes a viernes, cinco días en la semana. Yo perdí mi trabajo debido a una enfermedad que yo tuve sobre mis hombros y sobre mis codos. Día y noche aquí. No hay que comer. Aquí la única forma de uno medio sostenerse es con las ayudas de las personas de aquí del barrio. Que nos ayudan por ahí una librita de arroz que un aceitico, que un tomate, 
y aquí eh, a diario lo que se come es arroz con huevo y nuestras familias allá en la casa pues aguantando hambre porque no tenemos de otra cómo solucionar este problema. Las niñas entran a las 11 de la mañana a estudiar, llegan acá a las 7 de la noche y muchas veces me ha tocado decirles que nos acostemos sin comer porque la situación no, no, no nos da para más. Eh, nos ha faltado la comida, pero nosotros hemos tratado de, de sobrevivir como así sea con un plato de arroz. Mi casa ya me la quieren rematar. Estamos a punto de perder la casa. Mi hija la semana pasada se comió la piernita. Le cayó una guapanera encima en la, en, en la piernita. Como pueden ver, eh, yo me quemé la pierna. La estamos curando solo con, con remedios caseros. Por falta de la EPS eh, no hemos podido ir al médico. Se veía rojo, rojo, rojo. Ahorita ya tengo costra. Tengo un hijo recién nacido. Yo tengo pañales. Eh, mi señora tuvo un embarazo después de que yo salí de la empresa. Tuvo un embarazo duro porque casi lo pierdo, fue un embarazo de alto riesgo. Duró ocho meses con amenaza de aborto debido al estrés y a la situación que estábamos viviendo. Eh, lo, lo sobrellevé sin EPS, sin nada. Eh, pues yo sentí mucha tristeza porque a pesar de que mi papi lo despidieron, se nos, nos, se nos estaba yendo la tristeza, pero gracias a Dios a mi hermanito Martín, llegó la felicidad a esta casa. <risa> Son 10 meses que para nosotros han sido 10 meses de lucha y, y queremos que mucha gente siga este ejemplo para que algún día se nos respeten nuestros derechos humanos, se nos respeten nuestros derechos como seres humanos. Yo de todas maneras, yo continúo aquí en la lucha, a pesar de que la situación en mi hogar es muy dura. Cuando seamos grandes, yo quiero que esta historia nunca se olvide. Gracias. Y lo más complicado y lo más horrible es que el gobierno colombiano sabe de esta situación, incluso el gobierno norteamericano. Por eso es que nosotros les pedimos la ayuda a ustedes de corazón de que si nos ayudan a denunciar esta noticia en Estados Unidos para que la gente se concientice, para nosotros va a ser la ayuda más grande que hemos esperado durante todo el tiempo que llevamos acá. Well, wonderful. Uh, I, th I think that video really shows some of the conditions which exist not only necessarily in Colombia, but certainly in Colombia, but also at factories throughout what we used to call the third world or, or the developing, uh, which I think is a misnomer, but the developing world. Um, so it's, I think, illuminating for most of us here in the United States that don't have to work under these kind of conditions to see that kind of video. So, uh, Yeah, the workers, they actually describe the conditions in the plant as 30 or 40 years behind the conditions in the auto plants here in the United States. Um, they've, you know, been without the, the robots that do the automatic lifting and stuff, and they've been doing that by hand. They've been working 12-hour days, um, you know, just really difficult conditions for workers. Um, and it's because of that that they, they organize together. They've got these injuries. They, they're in a very dire economic situation. Their families are going hungry. So they actually organized this group, Asotrecol, and they've been... Um, They've been out in front of the U.S. Embassy for a year. They started August 1st of 2011, and when they completed their year, they decided that they had, you know, they'd been ignored uh, by the company. They hadn't had any sort of improvement in their situation, and so th at that point, they began a hunger strike. Okay, all right. And so when, when they were outside the, the, the factory, you know, beginning in August of last year, what was it they were doing? They were just doing a picket line, or um, so they actually. When they first started the association, they were doing a lot of um, protests and, and marches in the streets and things in front of the factory. But then on August first, they actually moved in front of the U.S. Embassy, and the reason that they chose that site was that General Motors received bailouts from the U.S. government. Mm -hmm. So we, the taxpayers, provided tax money so that this company could, um, you know, not go bankrupt, and that money was then used against the, the rights of workers in Colombia. And they thought that that was a big injustice and that all of us should stand up and make a lot of noise and, and make General Motors do what's right. Mm -hmm.
Okay. All right. So our, our tax dollars that were used to bail GM out That's right. are then being used in Colombia. Uh, of course, we assume that um, bailing GM out was doing something here in the United States, but we're also you know, bailing GM out in, in foreign countries. Uh, and then our tax dollars are, are being used to subsidize these rather deplorable conditions. That's right. Right. Okay. All right. And, and recently they did something more kind of dramatic, at least to, in my mind, with sewing their mouths shut. That's right. right. Yeah. Talk about that for a minute. Sure. Yeah. So they've been in in this tent for the last year, and it's a, a very tough place to be. Let me just speak about that for a second, because in Bogota it, it rains just about as much as it does in Portland. It's a cold place. So they've got two tents, and then they've got a makeshift shelter that they've created out of bits of wood and pieces of plastic that they found on the street. Now that's been both their meeting space and their living room. They've used uh, three rice cookers to cook all of their food. The food that they eat has been stuff that they've received from the neighbors who have been walking by. So this has not been an easy thing that they've maintained 24 hours a day, seven days a week for 12 months. Um, but, but that's how deep their commitment is. Now on August 1st, when they were coming up to a whole year in these conditions, um, they decided they needed to, to up the ante a bit. They needed to do something because their families are continuing to starve and they couldn't hold on to the little that they have for very much longer. So at that point, they decided to sew their mouths closed in a hunger strike that they're, they were prepared to carry on until General Motors resolved the situation or else until they, they gave their lives so that other workers wouldn't be treated that way. Mm -hmm. Okay, and and so so when when did they start sewing their mouths shut? On August first. August first of this year. Of this year. Right. Okay. Yeah. And has has that had any uh, effect? Yeah. So you know, I've as I said, I've been involved in this, um, trying to support these workers for really since April is when I, I really became involved. Um, and at that point, there were a few people that knew about it, um, but as soon as they sewed their their lips shut, that was you know the opportunity really grew for us to get word out about this. It was, um, it was very hard to see people that I know and that I care about, you know, fathers of families, sewing their lips closed to think about what could happen, uh -huh. uh, to think about these families continuing without their dads, you know. Um, but at the same time, it, it was such a good visualization of their commitment to, to the struggle. You know, they stated, as they were sewing their lips closed, they stated that either way they were dying. You know, gen the situation that General Motors has left them in meant that they're going to perish, whether it's from a hunger strike or if it's just from the economic, the dire economic situation that they're living in. Right. Okay. I, 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 you know, as you're talking about that, I just think that, you know, we tend to think of issues as being a issue right. and not drawing connections to them. So I think it's really important that we uh, acknowledge that this issue that's happening there to these particular workers are being replicated through a international system which we generally just call corporate globalization right uh, and uh, it affects them there in that particular manner here in the united states but we're affected by it also so this whole um, all these efforts, both in the United States and in Europe in particular, for austerity budgets and cuts to schools and education to health care, uh, all of that is all part of a global system. So, That's right, yeah. Right. And actually, today, um, the president of the association, he's in Detroit, Michigan, where there are a number of auto workers that have come together and they're all speaking about the ways that they're affected. Um, by different issues, so it, I think that what you're talking about is exactly right. You know, the, the issues of the workers in Colombia are are tied to the issues of workers here in the United States. Right, yeah. So, how could workers or anybody in the United States help these particular workers? Yeah, that's a great question. Uh, the main thing that we need to do is get the word out. So we just need everybody to pass on this this news, this information, the videos. Um, we can give you a link for that. Um, we just pass it on to everyone that you know, onto your networks, your friends, your within your faith communities. Um, because the more that we get the word out, the more that it gets covered in the mainstream press, and the more pressure General Motors feels to sit down with these workers and resolve the situation. All right, very good. The other thing I will say is that 
we have a new trade agreement which we signed within the last year, I'm going to say a year, mm -hmm. uh, with Columbia. It was one of uh, four agreements that had been actually negotiated by George W. Bush. He knew he couldn't get them passed through the U.S. Uh, Congress, and so it was left up to President Obama to present these agreements. And one of the issues with the agreement with Colombia was the deplorable labor conditions, in particular the issue of, of uh, labor activists being shot, murdered, killed. Right. Uh, and that was a condition of our signing was that those kind of conditions were supposed to be uh, taken care of and weren't supposed to be happening anymore. But yet, uh, in spite of that, or maybe because of that agreement, they do continue. And so this is just another, uh, another example of how the labor um, protections that are supposedly in these agreements just don't work. Right, yeah, the Labor Action Plan was supposed to address a lot of that. But the Labor Action Plan actually asks to increase the number of labor inspectors who are charged with making sure that the, the rights of workers are respected. Um, you know, Aso Trico, these members, they've actually shown that there's been uh, widespread fraud and um, the falsification of papers by the labor inspectors within the plant. Actually, they've, uh, they've seen that one of those labor inspectors has been, um, he's been put in, in prison. He's serving a jail term for, for what he's done, and there's a bunch of others that are being investigated. Right, okay. Well, this has been a very illuminating, uh, I think, conversation for probably for me and for most Americans who might be watching it because we just don't know what goes on elsewhere. And, of course, our corporate media, you will never see this story on corporate media. Yeah, it's hard. Right. It's, it's hard, right, yeah. So uh, tell us a little bit more about, uh, you said Witness for Peace, that you had gone down to Columbia on a witness with a Witness for Peace group. Now talk a little bit about Witness for Peace and, and this group that you went with. Yeah, Witness for Peace, uh, they do a variety of different delegations to different parts of Latin America so that people can bear witness to what is going on. Um, at this moment, actually, the president of the association, Jorge Pada, has been able to come up to Detroit. He's there, and he's being supported by members of, of Witness for Peace. Um, and. So let me just say, they, their hunger strike lasted for, for three weeks, 22 days. And at that point, they received an agreement with uh, General Motors to sit down and negotiate. Now, unfortunately, that was only with a subsidiary, with Comotores. Um, and so they spent, at that point, they lifted their hunger strike. They spent a week in negotiations, and they weren't offered anything that was reasonable. And so... Um, just last Monday on Labor Day, they, they restarted the hunger strike. They restitched their lips, and they've been going already for, for a week. Okay, all right. I, I, I know that you know, here in Portland we had Cameron Witten, who did a hunger strike out in front of uh, the Portland City Hall right. uh, for um, housing. His issue was homelessness and, and housing the homeless. Uh, and I think that he went for 45 days, uh, lost a lot of weight, 50 pounds, mm -hmm. uh, made a big difference. Uh, so I, I really admire people that go on hunger strikes that really are uh, in the, uh, <laughs> in the uh, what we hear so often we talk about, or the media talks about heroes. You know, these people truly are heroes for, for the working class. Yeah, we just we hope that we can keep them as heroes and not as martyrs. We'd really like yes. to put as much pressure as we can on General Motors and and get them to resolve the situation so that so that they continue to live lives. Yeah. Okay. I'm going to try and find out uh, what the CEO's uh, email address of General Motors is, and let's see if we can get some people to write letters or or notes to uh, to him, and let's see if that might create a little more pressure for him. Um, do you think it's worthwhile contacting our federal representatives and senators about this issue? Yeah, definitely. Okay. And we actually, we have um, the CEO, Daniel Ackerson, we have his home address, so we can, we're able to send postcards uh, if, if people are okay. interested in doing that. All right, well, we will, uh, you'll give me that, and That's we'll right. put that up on the screen so people can take that action, too. Okay, great. 
Good. Thank you very much for being here and joining us, Paige. Okay, great. So we've been talking with Paige Shell Sperling, uh, who is a labor activist here in Portland, uh, about the situation for some GM workers in Colombia who have gone on a, on a hunger strike. Just as the stories of these workers in Colombia are part of the worldwide system of corporate domination and rule, so is the story of how America and the rest of the world has, has suffered due to the Great Recession. I want to invite you to, to attend a screening of Heist, Who Stole the American Dream? This video doesn't just tell the story of the theft of our economy by the banksters. That is certainly part of it. Heist goes deeper. As it goes back more than 40 years to look first at the secret memo entitled Attack on the American Free Enterprise System. This memo has been described by Greenpeace USA as a blueprint for corporate domination. Who was the author? None other than the soon-to-be U.S. Supreme Court Justice Lewis Powell. Heist goes step-by-step step to expose the systematic implementation of Powell's memo by both U.S. political parties over the last 40 years, culminating in the deregulation of industry, outsourcing of jobs, and re regressive taxation, leading to the Great Recession and the dismantling of the American middle class and the behavior talked about during today's program. Heist provides a clear, concise, fact-based explanation of what we, need to do, what we need to do to restore our representative democracy. The Alliance for Democracy has organized two screenings of this exciting new video. First on Monday, September 24th, 7 p.m. at the Hollywood theater here in Portland. But if you can't make that, then please join us on Friday, October 26th at 7 p.m. at the First Unitarian Church. After the show on September 24th, stay around for a Q&A discussion with Tom Chamberlain, who is president of the Oregon AFL-CIO. And after the October 26th screening, do the same with Barbara Dudley, who is co-founder of the Oregon Working Families Party. This is both are sponsored and organized by the Alliance for Democracy, co-sponsored by KBU, Move to Amend PDX, Move on Portland, and the Economic Justice Action Group of the First Unitarian Church. Populist Dialogues is now on YouTube. Go to youtube.com, search for Populist Dialogues. Click on the result with the Statue of Liberty icon to view all our shows this year and to subscribe to the series. They are also available on Blip TV. Search for Populist Dialogues. The mission of the Alliance for Democracy is to end corporate domination, establish true democracy, and create a just society based on a sustainable, equitable economy. To learn more, visit our national website at www.thealliancefordemocracy.org. I want to thank our crew today, Roger Bates, Joan Horton, Ethan Scarl, Janet Morris and Tom Thomas. And thank you, audience, for watching. We hope we'll see you again next week.